You're listening to Seminary Dropout, and I'm your host, Shane Blackshear. In cooperation with MissioAlliance.org, straight from my house in Austin, Texas to yours, interviews with leading Christian authors, leaders, and thinkers, because good theology should be for everyone. This is Seminary Dropout. Let's go. My guests are Monique and Vito Aido. They make up The Welcome Wagon, based in Brooklyn, New York. They're best known for their hybrid of gospel, indie pop, and folk songs. After ordering a guitar online, the couple taught themselves to play, write, and arrange music. Their artistic intuition, coupled with Monique's history in art design and Vito's past in poetry, led to the release of their debut record, Welcome to the Welcome Wagon, in 2008. The album was produced by Sufjan Stevens and released on his Asthmatic Kitty label, as was their follow-up project, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices in 2012. Their newest project, Light Up the Stairs, is set to be released on October 20th on Gospel Song Records. Monique and Vito, thanks for being on the show. Thanks a lot for having us. We're glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I mentioned in the introduction that you're based in Brooklyn now, but I don't think either of you are from there. Yeah, that's right. Um, Monique has lived in New York for about 25 years, and I sort of in a roundabout way, followed her out around 20 years ago. Um, so, no, we're both from Michigan. We're both from rural Michigan. And and so in some ways, yeah, we're transplants. And, and the other hand, too, um, we both lived here our whole adult lives. And this feels like, this feels like as much, it feels like his home as much as anything, I think, at this point. Did you guys meet in Michigan? Yes. Yeah, we did. We We knew each other in high school. We both went to the same little high school, the same rural town that we grew up in. And we weren't high school sweethearts, but we kind of knew each other and, um, and kind of looked at each other across the gymnasium floor, I guess. And, uh, (laughs) and then Monique, when she was 18, she went to the Cooper union, which is an art school here in New York. And, and one summer we were both home for the summer and our sisters ran into each other and they said, Vito's in town. Monique's in town. They should they should see each other. They should say hello, and we did. And uh, that's how it happened. That's how it began. The rest is history. Yeah, I remember I had a little crush on Vito, but not like a bad crush. But, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I did. I remember in art class though, I wrote on a note that I would marry I would, I, if I could marry anybody I wanted to. I was like in ninth grade. I would marry um, Vito, and he was like my number one choice. <laughs> and then Matt Conrad was my second choice. <laughs> and it actually, I can't believe that it came true. Yeah. I really can't because I, I, it was just a passing wish. It wasn't like a. That's great. We didn't hang out at all. <laughs> Do you still have that notebook? I don't because I didn't think a thing of sure. it. It was just one of those passing little things oh, that you do when you're awesome. in high school. Man. But <laughs> it's stuck. I don't see Matt Conrad around here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. I, I, it's me. <laughs> no second places anymore. No, no. <laughs> I want to play a song from the new album. This is the title track, Light Up the Stairs, from my guests Monique and Vito Aido, who make up The Welcome Wagon. The seaweed grows on the ocean floor We ate it all and we wanted more God will give us And if you look for the stairs above They're made of light, they're made out I read somewhere or heard somewhere that at least Vito, you didn't grow up in church. Was that the same for you, Monique? No, I, I did grow up in church. So Vito, for you, how did you come to Christ? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I was baptized when I was a baby. I actually found out not that many years ago um, that I've been bat- I was baptized twice as a baby. My mom was Roman Catholic and, and she and my dad got together and my mom had me when she was very young 
And uh, at that point in time, the local Catholic church wouldn't baptize me because my parents didn't get married in the church and they weren't going to be part of the church and they were just doing their own thing. <clears throat> and so my mom was pretty frightened about what would happen to me if I died as an infant. So she and my uncle Mike baptized me in the oh, sink wow. with, you know, like when I was three or four weeks mm-hmm. old, if you look in the front of any Catholic missile, it says something to the effect of, if you need to perform emergency baptism, here's how you do it. And I guess for my mom, the emergency was that she was married to my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like, and uh, which was a kind of an emergency. Uh, and then so she baptized me. But then they baptized me later in a Presbyterian church that we went to every once in a while. And we sort of were connected to it on and off here and there. But it wasn't anything that we ever talked about at home. And it wasn't anything that was you know, thought of as something that we lived as a family or I wouldn't have been able to tell you, I don't think, you know, what Christian faith really was at that time. And so it wasn't until college where, you know, I think I've since done college ministry and having been a pastor for a long time now. And I think, you know, it's almost inevitable that somebody between the ages of 16 and 25 has some kind of, you know, psychological break with their past or has these epiphanies or lurches one way or another. And I did. And it was at that point that I started to pray. I had remembered a, like a sinner's prayer that I had heard on TV, I think from Charles Stanley. And one night I was just filled with all sorts of terror and fright and fear. And I started to pray and I didn't feel any better that night, nor did I feel better the next day. It took a really long time, but I kept praying and I started going to church, I think that week. Wow. Mm -hmm. Monique, did you, were Mm -hmm. you always Mm -hmm. um, accepting of the faith or did you have a time where you rejected it or walked away from it? What's your journey? Um, I took real, I think, ownership of it and it became really real to me when I was in college because I was on my own and choosing for myself whether I go to church or whether I believe. And so that was a really, really exciting time in my faith walk. But I um, grew up with a grandmother who was really, 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 um, really devoted. And um, she would read me the Bible and she would audio tape herself and send it to me in college. And um, I would listen to it. And uh, that was really special. So I was I felt very nurtured. Um, in that way. And the church was always very accepting of me as an artist. Um, and my mother was very um, supportive of me. They even had the pastor had me get up and talk about my artwork in church one Sunday. And I was just in high school. It was amazing. It was really, really amazing. We had, I think we both, Vito and I had pretty passionate parents. Um, yeah. And really caring, but, and I'm pretty devoted, passionate parents in general that cared for us. Yeah. And, and kind of, and they were kind of outrageous, like, you know, kind of um, centric (laughs) as well. That didn't hurt. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the kind of music that you were (laughs) exposed to growing up. I liked Simon and Garfunkel's um, bookends was my favorite album. That was yeah, that was my all-time favorite. And um, I, my mom <clears throat> was is a choir teacher and still is. And so um, she had like those choirs where you did dan- dancing and singing at the same time. And so um, I was always like admiring all of her students. And I would like sing their songs. And we were singing show tunes in my home constantly. My sister and I would put on shows and and uh, so that's a lot of show tunes and bookends. <laughs> uh, for me, um, I inherited my mom and dad's vinyl collection. I had a record player pretty early on, and they had the kind of stock record collection that I think a lot of, you know, a lot of Americans probably had in the 60s and 70s. It was a lot of Beatles, and it was a lot of sort of, and then edging on into the 70s, like the Eagles and Steve Miller Band and sort of a lot of classic rock, but then going back a little bit, you know. um, 
I listened to the Beatles a ton. I was sort of fanatical about the Beatles uh, from a very early age. And so the other thing that I listened to a ton was they had the double vinyl of uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, that Andrew Lloyd Webber uh-huh. um, rock opera or whatever it was. And when I became a Christian later, I was – uh, I knew the whole Passion Week story. I knew it all because I had that whole record memorized. And um, I don't know. I still sort of like that. I mean, it's we- it's a weird record and it's a lot of weird songs, but some of them kind of kind of hold up. I think it's the first song that I ever, what is it that one of those songs is in five? Uh, <laughs> try not to turn on two, two, three, four, five, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I read somewhere that in the beginning, uh, that music was very much just like kind of a hobby to both of you. Yeah. And even then when you were recording, you were just kind of doing it in your own time when you took time off from, from pastoring and Monique, I think you're a teacher. So when you were off from teaching Mm -hmm. um, and then the elders in your church decided to specifically give you time to, to make music. That's, I mean, that's kind of correct. It's um, the elders of our church have sort of commissioned us or set aside a time for us to do this, but it wasn't so much their leading. It was more, in some ways it was more, it was both me going to them and us and them coming to us saying, this is something we think is edifying for the church. It's something by which we make some small amount of money. Um, and that it was something that we could, you know, that it was something that, uh, God was doing in our life. And so that they want to, they wanted to honor that. I think, um, I mean, really early on, we didn't think about it I don't think we thought about it vocationally really at all in any sense, vocationally in terms of that it would gain us any income, nor vocationally that we thought it was a calling any more, any more than it was a calling early on because we got to do it with friends and we had a couple of friends that we played with and for, and that was important to us, but it didn't, I mean, it didn't, I mean, it barely occurred to us that we were a band until the first record was out. I mean, it was really, it sort of happened in such a way that um, it wasn't something that we planned on doing. It really wasn't. I mean, I get the feeling that sometimes when people say that, they really did plan on doing it in a way. I mean, I know that's a little bit suspicious, but um, when you hear people say, I had no idea this was going to happen, but we really had no idea this was going to happen. And, you know, I was holding a record in our hand with our faces on the front, still thinking, wait, what? how did this happen? I don't, what I, you know, I just, I made these songs up a couple of months ago. I don't know. I don't know how this is happening. Yeah. And part of, I mean, and a big part of that was Sufian taking us into his world and um, all of a sudden, boom, we had our own (laughs) record. That was really stunning that he produced. So that's a big part of your story. It can't hurt that one of your friends was <laughs> one of the most popular musicians in the world. Yeah, the yeah. Um, or I don't know if he was at the time. I mean, well, he wasn't at the time, but he was still who he is, which is somebody who's just profoundly, profoundly yeah. gifted and talented. I've never met anybody like him, and I don't know. I mean, I, there, I've seen, I, I haven't seen a lot of musicians work, and I haven't worked with a lot, but I've worked. With pretty good handful at this point but even before you know asthmatic kitty was just him and his and lowell and you know printing up a thousand cds and and so it never occurred to us or that we thought it was going to be as you know big as it was but um even before he was very famous or popular or even before any of those things that happened it was abundantly clear that um you know this was somebody who was helping our music to become something far bigger than it would have been in just about every single way. I mean, he was helping us to develop and, and giving our music a sort of context that it would never have had. And, and that also, I mean, it also taught us a lot. I feel like it was not only a huge, huge gift to have him pull us onto his ship and get to go with him, but I also got to, learn from him about songwriting and arranging and and hearing and playing his stuff over the years not only the stuff that we did but i played in his band for a number of years and playing his songs over and over and listening to his work and listening to what he did to ours it was you know an education that 
I didn't anticipate would ever happen, but I, I really can't imagine anybody getting a better musical education than what we got like the first five years that we were a band and making a Christmas record with him and, and playing with him. I mean, I think every interview I've read or listened to from you, the Sufjan connection comes up and it's a really notable thing. Mm -hmm. His music has meant so much to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people around our age. I think, mm -hmm. I remember, I think Pace Magazine ranked Illinois as like the best album of the, the last decade. Mm -hmm. um, that's no small thing. Yeah. You, and I know you've, you knew him when he was really just more about writing music, I think, than performing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know he's a Brooklyn guy. I guess um, proximity had had something to do with you yeah. knowing each other. Yeah, yeah, we had we had friends in common. I mean, I'm, we met him, I think, in 1999. I think it might have been late '98, but it was sometime around then. And I didn't know he was a musician really until after a year or two after I we met him. I mean, maybe not that long, but it was, it wasn't the first thing that we knew about him. He was doing an MFA when we first met him in creative writing. How did it come about that he, you know, invited you onto his label and, you know, help you so much musically? Yeah. Well, again, it was really, um, I mean, he, you know, it's when you say invited us to his label, I mean, I knew what he, I think about, I don't know, six or nine months after we met him, he gave us a copy of his very first record, but <laughs> You know, to say that he had a label, it really is true. But we knew lots of people and still do who would say, okay, this is our label. But it right. really is just them and, and um, you know, a designer who had made a logo for him and a P.O. box that they got out. And that wasn't that much more. I mean, Asthmatic Kitty wasn't much more than that at that point. And so, but what he was doing and what we were doing together is making music. And he... Um, invited us to be to be part of that and and when i say part of that i mean sometimes a lot of times that just involved him bringing over like a four track or an eight track and mm -hmm. he'd say well let's make a couple of songs or have you written any songs and the very fact that he asked that question was really also profound because um i'm not a very good guitar player now 20 years removed from that time and i was a wretched guitar player then and he <laughs> And he would just say offhandedly, like, like uh, you know, have you written any songs? And so I didn't, I sort of just thought, oh, of course, well, I don't know, I'll try. And so I would try to write songs. And I think if somebody encourages you in that way, it wasn't like a sort of direct encouragement, like, you can do it. It was more uh, implied. Well, have you written any songs? And then he would, you know, he would say, I wrote this song, and then he would play it for us. And then we would all be dead in the living room after he played it for us, you know, like, you know, uh, I think, oh, gosh, I can't write like that. But then, you know, you'd try. Um, there, there was another friend that um, significantly helped us in our in the development of our band. And this was a friend that was coming to us in weakness. Um, he had had something traumatic happen in, in his life and he um, would come and go to church with us on Sundays. And then we would go to back to our apartment and we didn't have a lot of money. So we would always eat London broil, which is like a very cheap meat. It's the worst cut of steak. <laughs> it's like you're pretending that you have steak and it is sort of steak, but it's like shoe. I've never it's like it. shoe leather. It's really bad. <laughs> if you ever go online, it's like, if you're going to have this cut of meat, cut it against the grain this way. And you know, you have to do like seven <laughs> things yeah. To it so that you can chew it. Because I'm still chewing parts of the, some of the ones we had with that guy 20 years ago. <laughs> Vito's a great cook though. So he, he did, he did magic with it. Um, but so our friend would come every Sunday and we'd eat together and he would cry. And then he would say, would you just play me that song again, please? Would you just play me that song? And so that was like the first song that Vito wrote and we would play it for him every Sunday for months. And in that friend asking us, we kind of became who we are, you know, and he did it out of weakness. So I, we've had so many friends help us in so many ways. It's, 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 um, I can't even, we couldn't even write them all down. I, there were so many things and so much encouragement. 
I mean, I think the aim of artists are wanting to know, can I make something? Can I create something that will affect people? And I can't imagine the encouragement to have that friend who needs needs some help who needs to be affected and saying the the way I want it to be affected is for you to play that song for me and that's got to be huge yeah it yes was, it was a very moving yeah time in our life I wonder how you and this is also a question you get asked often but how you split your time now being bivocational is something that's not easy and Vito I know you're still pastoring and Monique mm-hmm. are you still teaching yep yeah I'm loving it I wonder how much time you get to devote to music and what that looks like if it's a bit here and there or if you get to take large chunks of time off for that. It's more the former. It's more bits here and there. And, um, you know, to be honest, there's a bit of grief there or at least, uh, I don't know, what grief seems uh, too big of a word, but I think there's a part of us that really wishes we could do music more, but we also feel passionate and dedicated to the other work that we're doing. So I don't think that our case is that, um, is that unique. We know lots of people in our church and in our, in our, in our circles of friends and in our orbit who have all kinds of vocations that they have, you know, they, you know, friends who work in the office, but they also make a magazine or friends who, do this sort of work, but they also make quilts or they really want to cook or they really, you know, or are taking classes in accounting and they want to do that. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm the a billionth person to say this, but our economy and our way of life now is different than when I was growing up. And my dad just worked at Ford Motor Company and he got up and he went there and he worked there for nine hours a day. And then he came home and, and that was where he worked for his whole life. And that's not, <clears throat> that's not who, that's not what a lot of people are doing in this day. And so that's not what we're doing. Um, it's hard though, because, you know, like we're, so we're getting a few calls here and there now saying, can you come and play? And we would love to do, you know, we've toured a little bit. We got to tour last year with Sandra McCracken a little bit and we loved doing that. She was really generous to us and, and it was fun mm-hmm. to go out and play mm-hmm. and we love playing. But right now I mean, it would be so hard. We had people, I've had people call us and say, would you come and play? And it's hard to pull off financially and it's hard to pull off logistically yeah. finding childcare. And if you get one tour date, can you string a couple along it? And then the other day I was trying to play a couple of the songs from the new record and I would have to learn how to play some of these songs again, because we were worked like crazy on them a year ago and I wrote them all probably a year or two ago mm-hmm. and then learning to play them and learning the arrangements. And there was nothing else in my mind for a while than the arrangements of these songs and trying really hard to, finger pick this song that way and the other day i was at a loss for how, like what even the chord progressions were for some of these songs so it's kind of hard because you sort of put some of these things in your short-term memory and we don't have you know we don't have time to i wish we had two you know a day or two that we just did music and it was a little more consistent but that's not what we have now and that's okay it's you know when we are uh in our late 50s uh we're going to go out like Peter, Paul and Mary and, you know, I'll grow out the sides of my hair and we'll go out and be a folk band and, <laughs> and we'll sing if I had a hammer and puff the magic dragon and sold to the nice rich man and all kinds of things. It's going to be great. Catch us in 2029. <laughs> <laughs> Come back on the show and we'll promote that record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll still, well, yeah, you'll still be doing this. I hope. <laughs> well, the thing you're talking about, it is, it is so, you know, kind of our generation, people in our age who have the thing that pays the bills and then the thing that they're uh, really passionate about. And that's not to say, I hope you're passionate mm-hmm. about pastoring as well, Vito. Yeah. But I also wonder, you know, our vocations for better or worse is something or something that we really um, find a lot of identity in. Mm-hmm. And I, I wonder if you both of you, either of you had a moment where you kind of realized maybe, maybe in the, the moment you realized that you were a band where you kind of realized, Oh, I guess I'm a musician now. Mm-hmm. I still feel awkward or I feel a little weird even saying that. And <laughs> we've now made three records and I've probably written a hundred songs and did a lot of the arrangements for the songs. And 
and have gotten to see multiple people produce and all those things. And I still feel like it's not quite mine to claim that I'm a musician or that I'm a songwriter. And I don't know, that's probably for a thousand reasons, um, both good and bad, but I don't know. It's, it's sort of a, I think it's a vocation that we rediscover each time that it happens so that we get invited to come play at some bar or some church and you stand up there and you have the guts to do it. And, um, you muster the courage to, to sing and look people in the eye and hope mm-hmm. that they'll look back at you and not laugh or hope that somehow there's a connection that you're establishing. And sometimes there is, and sometimes they laugh and sometimes they should have laughed. I mean, we've played some really bad shows, like really, really <laughs> bad shows, but we've also played some shows where it felt like something great happened or you meet somebody and they say, you know, uh, this song has meant a lot to us or this song got me through this time or, uh, you know, some camp, uh, I don't even know what it is in Texas, some youth camp. Um, one of the songs from our first record, um, called, but for you who fear my name, that's their theme song now at this camp. And somebody played me this recording of thousands of kids singing this song or somebody oh. told me that somebody walked down mm-hmm. the aisle to up on a mountain, which is a record out <laughs> song after first. And I was like, in their in their wedding. <laughs> like, it's, it's okay. All right. It's startling. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, it's funny you asked that question because right now I'm trying to, without any caveat, say I'm a musician. And just without judgment, I'm trying to practice doing that because I'm trying to say to myself, like, like no matter how many skills I've acquired, that that Vito and I have really been musicians and that's funny I've been trying to just own it a little more and uh, yeah because we really I mean, we are <laughs> see, see, see how she said <laughs> that we, like it's the up, the up like inflection we are we I mean we are, are right like we <laughs> are this podcast called us up and said they wanted to talk to us do we have a record coming <laughs> out yeah Can we write these songs I know. Like, yeah like you're faking it a little bit I mean, oh yeah they- I mean, and, you know, again, everybody talks about imposter syndrome and <laughs> yeah, yeah. we've got strains of it for sure. Yeah, yeah. But we had one one good thing for us is that, you know, the Psalms and being a Christian is like we come up, we come from the church and everybody in the church, we sing and we worship. It's type of worship. So it's, um, we, so we can own that as well, you know, that we are like worshipers. And musicians. Well, I'm, I'm curious about that. You know, we are, we're obviously at a point in time in the U.S. where we're definitely a post-Christendom society for the most part, and that varies in different places. Uh, but definitely in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. We're past a time when someone says something, and just because it's said by the behind a pulpit in a sermon that people will receive it, but people are, there's more uh, flexibility in listening to a song or poetry. Hmm. And I wonder if that's something that you think about a lot. Uh, I don't know if I think about it. What the right word would be explicitly or consciously. I love music and music has been, so um, important in my life. Uh, Music is one of the ways that I feel. And what I mean by that is that, you know, it, I'm (laughs) not very freed up emotionally and music is one of those places that frees me up a little bit. And some of that, you know, has been religious music and other times it's not religious music, but I don't think I ever consciously have thought that much you know, I'm going to try to communicate the gospel. And I think a great way to do it is music because that touches people in a different way. I've said those sorts of things, but that's been more of a description of what I've intuitively wanted to do. And has just been driven by my own desires and my own, mm-hmm. um, you know, the attraction that I've had to wanting to sing or to make music or to write music. So I don't think that any of that or much of my life at all has been by a conscious design of saying, you know, if we 
if we do it through music and if we do it in this style, then maybe more people will be open to it. I actually think that that's probably true, but I don't think that's my business. I'll just, you know, I want to do this because I love doing it and because I think I'm good at it. You know, that's what Flannery O'Connor said she wrote because she thought she was good at it. And so on the one hand, I'm really self-conscious and feel like an imposter. And on the other hand, I think that I've been given gifts to do that. Sometimes I think I'm good at it. And so um, I've been driven and we've been driven to make music because we want to sing to each other and because we want to sing to God and because we've had people say, we play that song for us either intimately or across, you know, to other people that we may not have ever met in person, but who have said, by buying music or by supporting it in some way. Mm-hmm. We like this and we, we think this is worth our time and our, and our support. And it feels great. I mean, we did this Kickstarter and it was a real, it was actually nerve wracking a little bit. And are we going to raise enough to make this record? And, um, the flip side of that though, was all uh, great messages that we got that said, man, we want you to do this. We really, we need you to do this. We're on your side. We're rooting for you. People, sending in money for no rewards, you know, sending in money and saying, here's, here's some money. We don't want the t-shirt. We don't want the anything. We just want to be, um, we want to be your friends and we want to be your supporters because we like what you're doing. And that's, that's great. But the, I mean, your original question is, you know, in Williamsburg or anywhere else is music. Yeah. I mean, I think that's obvious, Mm -hmm. but I don't think we did it out of design. It wasn't sort of thinking, you know, here's the subterranean uh, secretive way we can communicate the gospel. It was more, (laughs) I really like the lyrics of this hymn or um, I'm finding myself in the subway, just singing this line over and over light up the stairs. And I don't know what it means, but it's interesting to me. And I want to try to find out why. I, I think I've just noticed, I mean, in the own, my own church that I attend here in Austin, where, there are people who are on the skeptical side that are, you mm-hmm. know, searching. And the some of the songs that we sing are very, you know, declarative, definitive statements about uh, who God is. And I just, I have a hunch that they hmm. would not be receiving that if it hmm. were in a sermon. But uh, beyond, beyond like hearing it, they're actually yeah. like singing the words. They're yeah. actually coming out of their mouth when it's a song and yeah. I just always found that fascinating and I thought I thought that would um especially be true for your music because one it's uh, you know outside of the the meaning and the spirituality it's just objectively good I guess this can't be said, said objectively okay in Shane's mm-hmm. world objectively good music mm-hmm. um on its own and you know in a culture like Brooklyn like Austin where it's very common to be skeptical for your music to be so successful in those worlds as well is interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thanks. I want to play another track. This is The Outside Road from the new album Light Up the Stairs by my guests Monique and Vito Aido of The Welcome Wagon. We made each other with disregard. kind of discovered your music because the music pastor at my church was playing your songs in our worship. Mm. Uh, you mentioned Up on a Mountain, that's one. Mm-hmm. And there's songs that uh, I sing to my daughter when I put her to sleep at night. Aww. They've just become so meaningful to me. And so it's been so, so wonderful to get to sit down and, and talk with both of you. And um, I've just... I've loved this conversation and I've loved, I feel like I've gotten to know you from just uh, preparing for this interview and reading, reading other interviews and listening to you. And I got to listen to a little bit of your sermon veto, uh, one of them for, on iTunes. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I just appreciate who you are. I hope that you guys get to tour sometime and I hope you come to Austin, Texas. Yeah. Oh yeah. We'd love that. Thanks for saying that. That's yeah, thank you so uh, much. a great gift to tell us that and to, 
to know that the work we've done affects a person like that or affects, you know, is, is in, in any way a part of somebody's life is a really great gift. So thanks for telling us that. And I hope, do we, have we played in Austin? I think we played in Austin at some point, but I mean, not very often, but I think we were down there. I'd love to come. We'd love to come down at some point. Um, yeah, we love Texas and the people from Texas. Yeah. Good. We'll come. Please yeah. come. Everybody yeah. seems very proud of their state and happy about their Yeah. Yeah. And I like that. I like that feeling. Yeah, I do too. I like that. Monique and Vito, thank you so much for oh, yeah. being on the show. The, the new album, I haven't talked about it enough, I don't think, but the new album, Light Up the Stairs, it's so wonderful. Um, I love all of the tracks. I think Galatians 2.20 is probably my favorite. Monique, you do the heavy lifting on the vocals on that track. Yeah. So wonderful. I love it. I'm so uh, excited yeah. for the album to be out there. Well, thank you. We're really grateful, too. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Remember, you can find all the show notes for this show and all shows at shaneblackshear.com. Oh, and hey, have you ever thought about starting your very own podcast? I bet you have. And I think you should do it. In fact, I've created a course just for you to teach you everything that I've learned over the last couple of years producing Seminary Dropout. So if you're interested in podcasting and want to learn how, Go check out my course. You can go there by typing in podcastingforeveryone.org. And you can get a special discount by typing in the discount code Seminary Dropout, all one word. That'll give you 25% off. So go check it out. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. Thanks to those that left ratings and reviews on iTunes this week. Remember, that keeps the show front and center. Also, remember, you can find me on Twitter at at beard on a bike that's at beard on a bike also i'm on facebook facebook.com slash shane blackshear one two three and remember that seminary dropout is listener supported you can visit support seminary dropout.com and press become a patron remember this music you're listening to right now is by dl rossi you can find him online on itunes and at dlrossi.com All right, thanks again for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Love you. Take care.